Hello everyone, happy Friday. I'm so pleased to be back for This Reads Tea Reads with my mum Donna. Hello everyone. Who as you know had a bit of a traumatic <laughs> week but you're feeling much better I now. Am. I am, I am indeed. Feeling nicely and yes. back to normal. Yes, you had a horrible scold. Yes, yeah. Um, doing a lot better. A lot better. <laughs> Thank yeah. you for all your good wishes. Thank you very much. It was very much appreciated. <laughs> so today mm -hmm. we're going to be making one of our favourite things, but a variation on it. Yeah. So I think 2020 was definitely the year of banana bread. Everyone started I making think so. it. Yes, yes. yes. And um, we fancied doing a banana bread this weekend, but we're trying a different one. We're yeah. both really enjoying Nigella's new we cookbook. Love it. Yes. Show it. yes called Cook, Eat, Repeat. Yes. And we watched the TV show, didn't we? We did. It went with. We did, and we thought it was amazing. And this was one that we really wanted to make. Yes. And with the right number of bananas, that was the yes. deciding factor. It's quite good because you only need two bananas, right? Yeah, I, I used about yes. two and a half because ours were a bit small, but we only had three, so it's easy enough to yes. get rid of the other yes. <laughs> by a little nibble. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. yeah. Yep. So we're making her chocolate tahini and banana bread, which sounds yep. really good. Sounds you can delicious. also do it as a pudding, she says, but mm. we're making the bread version. Yeah. Because that's what we fancy. Yeah. It'll make a really nice weekend treat. It will, won't it? Yeah. So I've got the bananas mashed up here already. Yeah. Yep. Um, I've got brown sugar, dark brown sugar, and white sugar. Yeah. Chocolate chips. An egg, vanilla essence, oil, tahini, yeah, and some sesame seeds, and then in here the dry ingredients of cocoa, and we're using yes. rice flour, yeah, we which she recommends in this, and that makes it gluten free. So yeah. that's a good tip as well. But I think you can just substitute plain flour. You can also you just use plain flour, yeah, yeah, if you don't have. We have a very good friend who who loves um well she can't eat she can't eat anything with gluten no. now. And if she visits again next summer, yeah. then we want to be actually have a new variation of Yes, because we had thought about making yes. a banana bread, but we didn't know a gluten free one. No, we didn't. So, so we couldn't make that one. for her. So we're yeah. trying this out with her in mind as well. Right. <laughs> so first of all you're yeah. gonna use the electric mixer mix it says um Pop in the bananas and then the oil. Okay. Yeah. I've got my KitchenAid to make it nice and easy. Yeah. Lovely. This is a good one for the KitchenAid. Although I imagine you can probably just use. Yes. Yeah. Well, you would. Yeah. You would just yeah. use the mixer. Yeah. But yeah. I love to get my KitchenAid. Yeah. Well, it's so. nice. It's it's good. It, yeah. It appreciates the airing. What else? Mix those first, and then you're going to mix in the tahini. Okay. We had such a difficult time with oh, this. You know, Nigella says something like, she says somewhere here, um, where, um, any recipe in this book that has tahini in it, do try and get proper Middle Eastern tahini, which is smokier and more fluid, with a full-bodied velvet, velvetiness, than the more widely available Mediterranean one. On which I have bent more spoons than Yuri Gellner. And I thought, oh, I thought, I wonder what type of arm tahini is that was in our cold larder, of course, because she says to keep it at room temperature before you yeah. make this. Sure enough, it was it rock solid. Rock it's like solid oil to separate. Yes, and all oil at yeah. the top. Yeah, so I spent, what, about half an hour trying to, first of all, I, I finally figured out that if I put it in a bowl of Boiling water is a little bit careful. <laughs> favorite thing right now. <laughs> <laughs> I it heated it yeah, up and enough that I could at least get the mix yeah, the two together. Yeah, but, yeah. Oh, that was a bit of a nightmare. Yeah. So if you can find I, you know, um, good yes, quality, good tahini, quality tahini, rather than just the waitress special, whatever it was that we had, <laughs> I don't know. <laughs> <laughs> 
Look, you can smell yeah. that. I know, it really smells. Well, tahini sesame. is like sesame it butter. Is sesame. Yes, it is. It is, it is isn't it? And yeah. there's yeah. that strong smell of sesame that I really like. Mm, I do say. too. So now it's time to beat in the egg, then the sugars and vanilla. So egg, milk, egg and sugar, and okay. vanilla. Lovely. Beat that in. Mm -hmm. I'll just turn it down a bit lower. Yeah. I'll add the sugar. Both sugars. Yeah. And this recipe is obviously available online. So I'll link to it in the box down below. So you can make it too if you fancy it. Turn it up a little bit. Yeah. Well, that looks delicious. It's quite a liquidy. It is. It yeah, is it's you very liquid. You added the cocoa powder yeah. and the rice flour so, and so the that goes in there. Yeah, bit at a time. Bit at a time. Okay, she she fold it in a bit at a time. All right. So she, yeah, well, she to mix it in, right? Yeah, mix oh. it in a bit at a time. Okay. Yeah. So it doesn't go all over me. That I don't want be. cocoa powder all over me. <laughs> <laughs> but. It's been a really nice week weather-wise. Oh, here, it's been it? so lucky. Spring it, is really springy. Yeah, it feels like it has. Yeah. And we got some of these flowers that I'm making here. it that feel was a little cheap. But um, for my well, I know flowers always cheer you up. They do. I mean, I love flowers. I love yeah. having them in the house. Obviously outside, it's beautiful. But it's just a lovely thing. Well, I love them too. Yeah, and we got do. really pretty, well, tulips here. Yes. They're lovely, aren't they? Smith and yeah. Munson, which is a favourite of mine. And then a little bouquet from the Ceiling Island yes. Uh, yes. flowers. Yeah. Which yeah. is lovely. This one is scented and you can mm -hmm. really smell the long It is. Time. It's beautiful. I'll add the rest in. Yeah. That looks good. Mm. And you, she just says to sort of pour together the flour and the cocoa and the bicarb and the salt. So you're not having to sieve with this. It's not that fancy. Yeah, that's not really nice. Lovely. Mm. I'll just turn it up a little bit. This is looking so good. I mean, now it's like the smell of chocolate too. Yum. Mm. So yum, yum, these yum. I just. Um, You're just gonna fold in. Fold in, don't yeah. you know, the chocolate chip. Yeah. yeah. I think don't use it. I mean, I think we've always made the banana bread. It's something we've always loved. But there's something about the lockdown that it became really, I think, in the UK anyway, kind of a national treat. It did. I don't know? know if that happened anywhere else, but yes. certainly in the UK, yeah. it was all about banana bread. Yes. <laughs> and I think it was just it's. That feeling of comfort, isn't comfort. it? Comfort, it really is. And I mean, it's it's very low list of ingredients, and that most true. people still have, you know, some flour bananas. And this is actually a thrifty one with just one egg. I was thinking. Yes, I guess mm -hmm. that is true. Yeah, it's quite a good store cupboard one, actually. It is. It is, yeah. especially if you don't have rock hard to eat. <laughs> Even better. Yes. But, uh, your trick with immersing yeah. it in oiling water is a good one. <laughs> Should that happen? But <laughs> what's so ridiculous is I'm always someone who sees the worst case, you know, like sees accidents. And before you, I remember your grandmother telling me she used to be a physiotherapist that oh, so many children would choke on um, frankfurters, you know, hot dogs. Oh, yeah. So like, I think when I was about seventeen, before I I stopped myself from you know, every single time I'd slice it vertically down the middle the hot dog. No. Well, and my dinner was choked a couple years ago. <laughs> she had to perform a Heinrich manoeuvre on me in a restaurant. It was really traumatic. It was the worst I thing. Know, it was like the worst thing. So then, why do I do something stupid? You well, it wasn't your fault. It was just the hot water. It was the hot water. Wow. Well, it was unfortunately there's always a potential, and you know, we're a bit off hot water. We are. Now. I think it's going to be electric blanket yes. for us for next winter. In mm. case I've greased and lined it in, I don't know if it's well to use a, a liner. What do they call those? Loaf liners. Loaf liners. Yeah, yeah. yeah we but we never that. have to know. <laughs> we never have high tech <laughs> things like that. <laughs> they might know that about us. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> so hopefully this will be. Oh, it's fine. Fine. Normally banana bread. Yeah. 
kind of get springy. Well, uh, famous yeah. last words, but yeah, it should be should be fine. And then we've got sesame to just sprinkle on the top. Oh, sesame seeds! I love yeah, that. yeah. I like them in salads and all sorts of things. I really love the taste of sesame seeds. I do as well, actually. Yeah, yeah. they're nice in all sorts of things. Yes. I'm really, I'm really curious about what this will taste like. Mm -hmm. And it smells um, so good. It I does. Taste. And when the camera goes off, I suspect we'll be tasting oh, yes. the batter. Yes, we, we will be. <laughs> this baits, I think, for about 45 minutes. Is oh, that right? Look, it's 150 fan, 170 normal. And she says 40 to 45 minutes. Yes, and then she says you should really leave it till the next day yeah for the flavors to develop and but guess what for it to go extra <laughs> spidgy well i think we will try and leave it a bit anyway yeah, we'll leave it a while yes yes yeah so it should be fine um we also love her her banana and coffee bread. Oh yes, that's so good with um, espresso powder. With espresso mm. powder, that's so nice. Yeah. And that does, when you can, it does yeah. make it a bit better if you leave it. Yeah. But I think a lot it of does this taste coffee. quite nice. Straight, do. straight <laughs> away. I mean, there's no harm in it, is there? Yeah. I'm just getting mm. these on top. It does smell amazing. I it really does. does. And it's interesting to think of her pudding version too. I yes. mean, we might try that yes. sometime. But it's the really delicious, delicious banana too. loaf. Yeah. But I can imagine, you know, she puts a little, she puts yogurt in it stuff. Yes. Right. So we're going to pop this in the oven, let it bake and cool, and we'll see you later. So I've got the banana bread out of the oven, it's now completely cool. I'm going to slice it up and set the tea table. It smells absolutely delicious, I can't wait. And we're back, the tea table is set. The fire's roaring away. Oh. I'm feeling very cosy. Me too, me too. <laughs> Just wait. perfect. And yes, this smells amazing. It does really it? It does. I know it came out looking really nice. It's lovely and sort of chocolatey, mm -hmm. little bit fudgy looking on the inside. I can't wait to try it. Mm -hmm. Me too. So let's dive in. Okay. <laughs> Go. I don't think I've ever made a chocolate banana bread. I know that actually. I know that. So this is really neat. I'm wondering if you won't taste the banana much with the chocolate and the tahini. Yeah, because they're see. such strong flavours. Mm -hmm. mm -hmm. mm. Wow. Mm. I love it. Yeah. Mm. It's really different. Mm -hmm. It's really unusual, but really good. That tahini sesame flavour really comes through mm. which I love I love tahini but if you don't like sesame I think this would be too strong it would but, but if you love mm, it like yeah, you yeah. do yeah mm. and actually it's really, really good. good gluten free cake mm. Mm -hmm. so interesting mm. yeah but it's true like really unusual yeah and you can still taste the banana how interesting i can mm. get the sweetness of the banana through yeah mm. Mm. and the chocolate chips in it it's really chocolatey mm. which is really nice it's that double mm. cocoa it and is. chocolate chips oh gosh so that's delicious mm. that is good it's quite well, strong i think i think you'd especially like it with coffee don't you it could go really well with coffee yeah I think it probably is. It's nice for tea too. Yeah. But I'm, and I'm not a coffee drinker, but somehow I could just imagine this. Or a hot coffee. chocolate. Can you mm. imagine with a hot chocolate? Yeah. That would be really good. That would be good. <laughs> it's nice with tea too. It goes very well with tea. <laughs> tea goes with everything. It does. <laughs> well, according to us, it does. <laughs> mm. Mm. Nice warming cup. But that's a real success. And you spotted yeah, the is. recipe and everything, and it's just wonderful. Oh, mm. yeah. It's really good I would definitely make that again and we'll see what it's like once it's kept 
Yes. It's a lot of good too. It sounds like it'd be a good keeping cake. You know, after the yeah. one that's made with oil R. Ah, yeah, um, it does. Well, we'll drop a little bit off at our neighbour. Yeah, we'll to hear she, likes she likes it, it too. <laughs> we sort of do, you know, we sort of uh, exchange notes. We don't we? We do. I hope she will. We must, we must find out if she's allergic. Sesame is one of oh, those things true. that some people are allergic. Yes. I would be careful of that. Yes. yes. Unfortunately, for those of us who aren't allergic, it is delicious. Highly recommend. Yes, it is. Well, I'm excited about our reads this oh, week too. as well. Um, do you want to start off with, I know you, you said you have two poems. I have two poems this week. This week. Yes. Which is lovely. That's such a nice poetry book. It is. This one. is beautiful. It's Ode to Flowers and it's a celebration of the poetry of flowers. It's edited by Samuel Carr and this edition is Batsford. So, mm. yeah. It, though, it's got lovely illustrations. It has it? all through it, colour yeah. ones. And they yeah. look a bit like railway, um, Railway, old fashioned railway poster. Yes, I know what you mean. Yeah. Yeah, even like, the cubby. Yes, yes. 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 That one you can yeah. see. You can hold that up. Yeah. It's lovely. It is. Now, of course, I've pulled out my. Um... Oh, sorry. <laughs> oh, no, it's my fault. I love the way, like, this is old stamps that we've obviously just cut off the top. And I saw the yes. <laughs> yes. <laughs> So, this poem is by Edward Thomas. It's called Celandine. I, I really love this. Thinking of her had saddened me at first, until I saw the sun on the Celandines lie. Redoubled and she stood up like a flame, a living thing, not what before I nursed. The shadow I was growing to love almost, the phantom, not the creature with the bright eye that I had thought never to see once lost. She found the Celandines of February always before us all. Her nature and name were like those flowers, and now immediately for a soft for a short swift eternity back she came beautiful happy simply as when she wore her brightest bloom among the winter hues of all the world and i was happy too seeing the blossoms and the maiden who had seen them with me february's before bending to them as in and out she trod and laughed with locks sweeping the mossy sod but this was a dream, the flowers were not true, until I stooped to pluck from the grass there one of five petals and I smelt the juice, which made me sigh, remembering she was no more, gone like a never perfectly, perfectly recalled air. Mm. It is lovely, mm. that one. It is. Um, I bet which one is. Yes, yes, me too. And very appropriate with Celandine. Yes, yes, blooming at the moment. At the moment. Yes, there's a real sadness to that. It poem is. Too. It is. And I, I think it's interesting that it's the smell of the mm. petal that he's plucked that brings him back to reality. Yes. In that one. Yeah. 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 That is beautiful. I'll hold on for my next one. Yeah, I'll just put on for yeah. here. Yeah. And. I have actually, I've also chosen two passages from the same book um, this week too, but it's because they were very appropriate, because of course we've just had Shrove Tuesday mm -hmm. or Pancake Day on Tuesday, which we did celebrate with pancakes, which you would have seen if you watched my previous video on books for foodies, but there are two contrasting takes on Pancake Day in um, this, and I thought I would read them. And the first one I'm going to read is actually about Carnival in New Orleans, wow. which occurs on Pancake Day. Mardi Gras, Day. Mardi Gras. Mardi Gras. Yeah. as she says in this passage, she prefers the term carnival mm -hmm. because it connects the New Orleans celebration with similar fates in the Caribbean and South America. Mardi Gras is, of course, the French word, and New Orleans was a French colony. So this, in some ways, is reclaiming some of that. That's so interesting. You see, I didn't realise that. Mm, yes. I know, I know. Yeah. It's a really fascinating yeah. little essay. And sorry, I should say this is in The Food Almanac by Miranda York. So this little essay is called Taste of Carnival by Lola's Eric Ellie. 
and I'm not reading the whole essay, but I've chosen a few extracts from it. I was born in New Orleans in 1963 and raised in that great city. When I think back to my childhood, one of my early cherished memories is of Carnival. A few years ago, I decided to host a Carnival party in that hazy afternoon, hours after the parades had passed. The menu had to include meat, since the whole idea is that Carnival is a Carnival's celebration in advance of the church-ordained abstinence of Lent. The star of the show was roast pork shoulder, stuffed with as many garlic cloves as I could fit, and braised slowly in the oven for 10 hours on a bed of sliced onions. Red beans and rice is the go-to dish for New Orleans and our cousins in Haiti, but I wanted to do something a little different. I settled on the black beans favoured in Cuba and Brazil. Inspired by Austin Leslie, the New Orleans chef famed for his fried chicken and Creole soul style of cooking, I created my own version of black beans and rum, using onions, garlic, oregano and olive oil to flavour the beans, along with the requisite rum. The combination spoke to my pan-Caribbean ambitions. For dessert, I wanted to resuscitate a forgotten New Orleans dish, rice fritters called callus, which are made with eggs, cooked rice, sugar and yeast. Unlike the, signature, the city's signature beignets, callus were never commercially popular. They were sold on the streets, often by enslaved women, much as fried delicacies are sold on the streets of the Caribbean today. When I told my mother I was making callus, she reminded me that Miriam Ortiq, one of the women who rode the float with us, used to make callus or calais, I'm not quite sure how you would say it, on those early carnival mornings. I smiled, realising that this effort to connect my city with the broader region surrounding it had also led me to reconnect with my own past. I thought that was such wonderful. an interesting essay and so full of personal remembrances, but flavours and history and culture. So wonderful. I mean, the lamb, of course, sounded amazing, but also yeah. that black was beans it? with rum. Yes, doesn't that sound amazing? So good. I love red, red beans and rice. I've had that style yes. of, you know. Yes fish and that's lovely but that sounds I know that sounded like a really good twist on it didn't it it did it was pork shoulder I think oh was it pork yeah, yeah. Mm -hmm. very very yeah. good <laughs> yeah yeah either would be delicious yes. isn't it do you want to do your other poem now or um I think I'll do the prose first okay. that's yeah. all right you are thank you so this is from the Morville Hours by Catherine Swift and um Again, one of those books, I'm sure that you mentioned it, that's so perfect to read throughout the year. Yes, yeah, yeah. and a favourite with both of ours. It is indeed. February's occupations in the books of ours are keeping warm and chopping wood. In the hours of the fast-off master, a prosperous man sits at his ease in front of a roaring log fire, one hand raised to fill the heat, one leg bared to warm his toes, a cauldron simmering over the flames. More logs are stacked in a neat pile outside. In other books of ours, peasants drop chop logs and bear them into the seigneur's hall. But in the calendar illustrations to the Earl of Shrewsbury's prayer book, three villages are lopping trees with curved bill hooks, while a woman gathers the loppings together. Logs were for the rich. The lord of the manor would have owned the timber of the trees on his estate. The villagers, if they were lucky, would have had the right to cut the underwood and to pollard or coppice some of the trees for firewood. Otherwise, they were reduced to gathering fallen sticks. The thinner the stick, the faster it burned. At the time these miniatures were painted, 
Europe was slipping once more into a period of profound cold. Poor summers were followed by bitterly cold winters. In 1431, all the rivers in Germany froze over. In France, most of the vines were killed by frost. The woman in the calendar illustration is tying the loppings into a faggot to make them last longer on the fire. There's an art to stacking a log pile, selecting the appropriate sizes and shapes so that the pile will be stable and self-supporting weighing them in the hand and placing the heavier ones at the bottom and sides, with the lighter ones at intervals between, so that each basketful will contain some of each, making the pile neat, regular, like building a wall, a wall against winter, like the shelves of pickles and preserves, lining the walls of the larder. Oh, I love that. Isn't that lovely? Yes, it's true. There is a real art to stack in wood. Not, not that I not never like had acquired. <laughs> <laughs> That's true, but I can understand that, that if you balance it right, your basket full would have the right yes. kinds of wood. Yes. And we know, because you often collect sticks for really kindling, don't yes. you? Yes. And it, it is true that the thinner, the, the faster they burn. Yes, that is. Yeah. Yes, yeah. Yeah. But, how interesting and what a horrible winter. Yes, I'm <laughs> ghastly, you yeah. know. Yeah. Um, well, I'll share my other choice from here, which is another perspective on Pancake Day. Oh, I have enough of the pancake ones. <laughs> no, and this one is about pancakes. Mm. So it's a second essay from the February chapter in here. And it's also a recipe by Regular Izuin, who, if you listened to my podcast before, you might remember Regular, because I've interviewed her a couple of times on that. But I really found this very interesting, what she writes about pancakes. In the 18th century, two variations on pancakes were popular, a rich man's recipe and a poor man's recipe. The poor man's pancakes were a simple assembly akin to the pancakes we still eat on Shrove Tuesday, although they were sometimes made with a rather mild ale rather than milk and often fried in lard. Rich man's pancakes made with the addition of cream, sherry, rose or orange flower water and grated nutmeg sound indulgently delicious. And yet, as the food writer Jane Grigson points out, we have let it vanish from our tables and cling masochistically to the poor man's <laughs> recipe. <laughs> the choice between the two was less to do with social standing and more about how you fancy you were feeling, with the more elaborate recipe often reserved for Sundays and feast days. The recipe was sometimes called a choir of paper, meaning a stack of paper, which refers to the elegant, paper-thin pancakes it produces. Cookbooks of the time suggest they were piled high and cut like a cake. If you make them, serve the pancakes with nothing more than a sprinkle of sugar and perhaps a little lemon juice, or raid the dusty liquor bottles at the back of the cupboard to make a Suzette sauce. Caramelised sugar and butter, tangerine or orange juice, zest and orange liqueur, served flambéed for a theatrical flourish. And then she gives the recipe for them in the book. But I just found that interesting and I love the idea of these very thin pancakes looking like a pile of paper. That is lovely. And, and, and maybe giving off wafts of orange or rose flower water. Yes, that I fascinating? know. I feel like next year we yeah, need to up the game. game. <laughs> and go for those rich man's pancakes. <laughs> Absolutely. You <laughs> can start at 7am with the pile. <laughs> <laughs> That's right. Well, anyway, here's your Thank you very much. So this one's a favourite Emily Dickinson one of mine. It starts, it will be summer eventually. It will be summer eventually. Ladies with parasols, sauntering gentlemen with canes, and little girls with dolls will tint the pallid landscape as twere a bright bouquet. 
Though drifted deep in Parian, the village lies today. The lilacs bending many a year will sway with purple load. The bees will not despise the tune their forefathers have hummed. The wild rose redden in the bog, the aster on the hill, her everlasting fashion set and covenant gentians thrill. Till summer folds her miracle as women do their gown, or priests adjust the symbols when sacrament is done. I don't know, I think that speaks to me of the yearning for the beautiful warmth of flowers, the, the joy yes. of walking out in yes. real summertime. I think we're all starting to yes. get excited for yeah. spring and, and summer coming, yeah. especially this year. I think <laughs> we so. all can't wait for that. Yeah. And yes, that yeah. is beautiful. She's such a clever poet. Oh, she is. Yeah. It's extraordinary. Yeah. Yes. Well, my last yes. one is from this book, which I've shared a few times before. Jane's Country Year by Malcolm Savile and this is an old childhood favourite of mine. You got this, you found this old edition for me for my last birthday yes. which was amazing and I know a lot of you also tracked down a second hand copy or you wanted to and I have good news because a kind commenter, I think it was Lynn, thank you Lynn, let me know on YouTube that she just found out that this book is being republished by Handheld Press in 2022. A little while so still, to wait. Yeah, still a little while to wait, but it is coming. Mm -hmm. And I'm so excited mm -hmm. that someone is republishing this because it's such a charming book all about a young girl spending a year on a farm as she convalesces. And I wanted to share one of the February extracts. One thing she talks about in this a little bit is that February is lambing season, which it is, and I'd hoped that we'd find, I hoped we'd see part of that this year, but I think they've taken the sheep from the fields near us because we're not seeing any right no, now. They no, must I'm be sure they must put them somewhere where it's easy. More accessible for yeah. lambing, so yeah. I'm a bit disappointed I'm not seeing any lambs yet. I'm sure they'll be back with their lambs. Yes, I'm yeah. looking forward to that. But another sign of spring coming in February is the arrival of catkins. And I wanted to read this little extract. After he had turned the car in the lane and they had waved to Aunt Kate, uh, to Aunt Kate he went on, the catkins are out, Jane. We saw them just now. I'll stop at the top of the hill and show you. By the track that led to the beech trees, he stopped and pointed to the high hedge where the fluffy lamb's tails were dangling from the bare branches of the hazel. January is not too early to see them, he said, but there were not many a fortnight ago. I love them because they mean that spring is on the way. Look, Jane, when I shake them, the pollen falls and you can catch it on the back of your hand. Golden stardust, Jane said, lovely. Mr. Herrick pulled the branch lower. Can you see some bright red threads on the tips of those little green buds? Those are the female flowers which are fertilised by the golden pollen from the male catkins and that is how we get our nuts in the autumn. Richard reached up and pulled off a twig with three fluffy tails. Put it in your smart new coat, Jamie, he smiled, but be careful you don't spoil it. Although Richard laughed at her, she pulled the catkins through her buttonhole, where they dusted the blue cloth with gold, and sat back defiantly as the car rushed down the hill and over the bridge into the village of Townsend. That is That's charming, lovely. isn't it? It's so charming. I hadn't known they're called lambs' tails. No, no, no. 
Are you don't see come them across that? Um, of course, in London, at least I've never seen them. There must be where they have there must be hazel um, trees, but we weren't lucky enough to see them. No. But actually, that's so lovely. I think it's such a lovely description, and so it's so true. Yes, yeah. it is. And I love that she puts the sprig in her buttonhole. Yes, <laughs> even though the pollen will be a devil to get out. <laughs> I did not think yes. about, well, I think to, oh, not her mother. Yeah, yeah. She, <laughs> she won't be <laughs> please. <laughs> Anyway, this has been mm. lovely. I can't wait to finish off our no. chocolate tahini banana bread and our tea. Yeah. But thank you so much for thank watching. You. I hope you enjoyed today's Tea Reads episode and I hope you have a lovely weekend ahead of you. Do give this video a thumbs up if you enjoyed it and you can subscribe to my channel by clicking on my face that pops up on the screen. But see you again on Monday. Goodbye. Bye bye.